Sunday. Here we are today, missions on Sunday. Um, are you going to keep everybody in the dark there, guys, or what? Oh, I, everything broke. We're just, service is over. Thank you. Oh, no, we're back. Woo! You're messing with the old man, weren't you? That was in night mode. I don't know if you know, if, you know, we have that type of thing here. We have that selection here. You're not supposed to fall asleep, though. That's why we brought in a special preacher this morning so that you don't fall asleep this morning. We had to fly him in from investors, and uh, it was a long, was a, we had to spend $11 to get you in. Over for, this is the shortest trip you've ever had to make as missionaries. <laughs> but missions on Sunday, it's a, an important time for us, and we instituted it the first part of this year that every fifth Sunday you say, well, that's next Sunday. Well, I realize that next Sunday, it, it could be a little iffy in the crowd. Uh, it's Memorial Day weekend, and sometimes I know some Sundays come up on your calendar. And, uh, you know, I, I know sometimes they get in that category of uh, everybody doesn't go to church on Sunday Sundays. I, I know you wouldn't ever think that way, but we bumped it up knowing that uh, Memorial Day weekend would be next week. And we wanted to have this be a part of our church. Missions is such a significant part of our ministry. It's part of our Acts 1-8 mission as a church, and God called every church to this. And so even as you looked on the, on the banners and you see the Acts 1-8 conference banners and you're reminded of that theme that we just got into a few months ago. It was October and now it's May and you think the whole, the whole year's gone. It's not. We're still continuing in missions and the importance of missions in our church all the time because it's really, really so significantly important. And missions on Sunday, this will be number two. We had Pastor Randy give a great report in January of all the missionaries, most all of them that he could cover, and, and we're going to continue to have, again, missions on Sunday. We'll have one in August, and we'll have one in October, each one of those months being months with five Sundays. Uh, I mentioned, of course, Pastor Bobby's going to be bringing the word here in a moment. I just want to interject something. I have a, a really important medal here. Uh, I was, uh, no one gave me one of these yesterday. I was kind of sad at Happy Five Soccer Club. So we order a few extra, and I'm the one who orders when I always order myself a medal. You know, <laughs> if anybody wants a medal, I have a couple more left, you know. But no, um, Happy Five Soccer Happy Five Soccer Club, we just finished up our 17th season, and we want to praise the Lord. When we give uh, claps and acknowledgement, it's unto the Lord and not to man. We, we are thankful for God working in us, both the will and to do of his good pleasure. And our 17th season, and uh, thank you, God. We played in a little bit of water yesterday, just a little bit. And uh, uh, if you want to have a really neat report, ask uh, Coach Adam. Adam was a sub yesterday, and Evie loved the rain, loved the water. And Coach Adam, you know, he was jumping in the middle of it all. And uh, I think that yesterday, um, Mom, did, did, did you come over to the rainy, wet field there, Heather? Or did you kind of stay over to, you enjoyed the water, didn't you? It was, <laughs> it was a neat day, though, wasn't it? We were able, we played three periods, and everybody got their medals got their pictures, they got neat little gifts from their coaches, and so praise the Lord. If sports isn't ingrained into the Acts 1-8 mission of our church, then it's vanity. It would be all for nothing. But it is the work of God in missions, and, and that's such a significant part of that. If we were not attempting, going after, being sent by God to give the gospel to all these children and their families. You say a lot of them might go to other churches, yes, but we don't know what their spiritual condition is, and that's okay. We're just here to give the gospel in our lives through our words, through our actions, and that's mission work. And we do it through ADP Sports, and we're honored that God would adorn that, uh, uh, ordain that and allow us and gives us, uh, gives us the honor of doing that. That being the case, we support a lot of missionaries. Local missions, regional missions are important. That's why you see a lot of little New Testaments out here, gospel tracts. They're very, very important. We have lots of materials to accomplish regional missions, but also international missions to go unto all the world. And so we support a lot of missionaries. 
and our Acts 1A conference will not be far away. It seems like the next October is already here. We have two mission trips planned this year. Uh, there's a small team going to Honduras soon, before you know it, the end of July, beginning of August. And also we have a team going in October, the end of October, uh, three quarters of the way to the end of October to Oaxaca in Mexico. So we continue to be involved in those things that are important to God. Again, for missions to be put in front of you on Sundays, again tells you, pastor, our mission support team, our pastoral team, we believe in the importance of missions. So this morning, we do have uh, Pastor Bobby coming to preach to us to be able to challenge us from a heart of a missionary who, of course, is one of our pastors on staff. And of course, there's no introduction, but Pastor Bobby, come and preach the word of God to us. Good morning, church. How you guys doing, okay? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you for this opportunity, preacher. And uh, I'm so thankful. Amen. First Bible Baptist Church, we're a trichotomy of ministries, okay? We have so many, but, you know, we, we believe in the family. We believe in ministering to one another, to edifying the family, to building up the family through the teaching and preaching of the Word of God, the edification, the small groups that take place, the investors, the uh, uh, discipleship classes, one-on-one, -on -one, all kinds of things. We're committed to what? To edifying the body of Christ as a family, to build the family up. And like Pastor said, we're also into sports, our background. We're both, you know, uh, how do you say, legends in our own mind. Amen. And uh, and we go way back playing ball and all those things, but we realize it gives us an opportunity. It's a door to what? To give the gospel. You know, when you have 80% of the kids that are coming on our field, do not go to this church. We don't know if they're church, unchurched, we don't know, but we have an opportunity as a church, as a family to present and do ministry and do missions up on those fields. And so we're into the family, we're into sports, and we're into missions. And uh, missions around the world. Missions here in Blue Springs. You see the New Testaments up here, and the discipleship lessons, and the different tracks that we have, and, and uh, all kinds of stuff, materials, tools that we use and God has given us and allowed us as a church to be able to take these tools and do missions. And so that's what we're going to look at today, having a heart for missions. Someone said to uh, David Livingston, talking about being a missionary, and he said that God only had one son, and he made him a missionary. He sent Jesus from heaven's glory to this earth. He's a sent one. That's what the word missionary means. You can't find the word mission or missionary or missionaries or whatever uh, in the word of God. But you find the principle. You know, for example, in Romans chapter 1, it says, uh, ye are what? Apostles. What does the word apostle mean? Sent one. That's what that means. They're sent to carry the good news. Sent to carry the the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what ought to be our motivation for missions? Well, a relationship between Jesus and his disciple, a true believer, someone that's been born again. You are a believer. You can go back to a time and place where you called upon the Lord and he saved your soul and you were born again by the Spirit of God and you've now become a child of the King by that spiritual baptism of circumcision when Jesus Christ saved your soul. But I want to tell you that the relationship between Jesus and his disciple is characterized by obedience. That song that we sing to the children, O B E D. I-E-N-C-E, -E, obedience is the very best way to show that you believe, amen. Like I got to sing a little bit on stage, amen, praise the Lord. But it's characterized by our obedience. So as a child of God, hello, we are to be obedient to what he's called us to do. 
That's very, very important. You see, when we get close to God, listen, when we get close to God, we understand His desires. We understand His motivation. Why He did what He did. Why He sent His Son into this world to save the world. We understand His outreach, okay? And this motivation should be natural when we get saved. You remember that, Becky? You remember College Station, 1978, October, the morning I got saved, and how the whole way back to our apartment, you and your, your brother and I, we were just singing and just praising Jesus, and then my friends started coming over. And instead of doing drugs and drinking, I was telling them about Jesus. You know, no one had to tell me to tell them about Jesus. I was just motivated with the fact that God saved me. God forgave me. The guilt was gone. The sin was under the blood of Jesus. And I had peace for the first time in my life. And guess what? I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I just had to tell somebody what Jesus did for me. I didn't know an Old Testament from a New Testament. I didn't know all I knew. Something happened to me. I didn't want to do the things I did the day before. I didn't want to be involved in the things I did before. I just wanted to please the one who saved me. So as I began to read the Word of God and study the Word of God, I didn't have to have the Word of God to tell me to share my faith. I just couldn't keep it in. There's something natural about a believer that shares his faith. You say, well, I haven't been sharing. Then something's happened. Something's happened. You've got away from your first love. Somehow you've slipped away into, it's, well, uh, you're more into self instead of the Savior and what he's done. Understand, we need to have a heart for missions. We need to have a heart for missions. Open your Bible anywhere, it's all good. But if it opens up to Isaiah 6, that's where we're going to be this morning for just a few minutes. And as you're turning there, listen to me. It says, a true believer cannot hold a neutral position when it comes to missions. You can't be neutral, okay? You, you're either over here on this side, you're, you're in the R&R, &R, you're on vacation, or you're on the front line. There's no neutrality. You're either in the will of God, doing what God says, or you're not doing the will of God and not doing what God says. It's just that simple. It's truth or error. It's black or white. It's right, it's wrong. This world teaches us that truth is relevant. No, it's not. Truth, Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word of God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What does it say in Matthew 4, 19? Jesus told to those men, he said, follow me. Okay, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. All right, did you see what? He said, all you got to do is what? Follow me, which means what? Go in the same direction that Jesus is going. Follow his lead. Now, why did he come to the earth? He came to the world, what? Not to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to what? Repentance. Romans 10 says, how are they going to hear without someone telling them? Hello. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm also preaching to myself. Because there are times in my life, if I'm not careful, I become very apathetic. David became apathetic. Apathy set into his life at the end of his ministry and of being the king 
And he just didn't, he just kind of sat back and didn't do anything about his sons and what took place in Israel. And so again, if we're not careful, apathy is going to creep in to us. We need to be on point. We need to always be intentional and understanding that, hey, guess what? I've been given a command, not an option. It's not the great option. Well, I hope you do this, or maybe you want to do it, or, or it's the great commission, commanding the church to go into all the world and preach the gospel. You see, the harvest truly is plenteous. It says over there in Matthew 9, but the laborers are few. Now, before we read Isaiah 6, I want to say one more thing. The mission of God, listen, is based on the character of God. Okay? And missions should never be just another program in the church. It needs to be total Christianity. We need to be on point, ready to go at any time, any moment as God brings those divine appointments into your life that you can be able to share the gospel with other people. Look at Isaiah 6 with me. Let's read a few verses, and then as Dr. Keene would say, we'll make our prayer, and then we'll uh, get into the word. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died... I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And and it stood, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings with twain, that's the old English word for two. He covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, notice verse 5, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Verse 10, Make the heart of this people fat. Make their ears heavy, shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Father, we come in the name of Jesus this morning, Lord, a needy people needing to hear from you. So Holy Spirit of God, speak to our hearts as only you can do. Take your word, penetrate our hearts. Father, get rid of the apathy that might be there. Get rid of the indifference that might be there. God, would you just bring about a spirit of obedience, a spirit, Lord, of urgency for the church to look up and say, Lord, use me. Use us for your glory. So God, bless your word as only you can do this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, here in Isaiah 6, Isaiah's name I like its meaning. It means Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. He does that. Amen. He will save somebody. People have called Isaiah the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. He is also called the missions prophet, prophet by a lot of people. And there was a revival that took place in this prophet's heart. Okay? And it produced a missions prophet heart, a missions heart. And so we're going to look today at having a heart for mission, for missions. If we're going to have a heart for missions, the first thing that's got to take place is we need to see God. Have you seen him? 
You say, well, no man has seen God. No. Have you seen him? Have you seen him? I, I, I saw him the day I got saved. As a matter of fact, I saw a lot of things that day. I saw my sin that day for the first time in my life. I saw separation from God for the first time in my life. I saw the holiness of God for the first time in my life. I was overwhelmed. I was convicted of my sin. Woe is me. What am I going to do? And I came down and fell at the altar and cried out to Jesus. said, God save my soul. I saw God. By the way, every time you open this book, this is the revelation of God. God's word. Do you see him? You know, as the singers were singing, I don't know about you, but I got a glimpse of the glory this morning. As we were singing, I was just closing my eyes and envisioning, envisioning around the throne, trying to kind of have a vision, maybe like Isaiah did, you know, because he saw the Lord high and lifted up. There's no one above him. See, the local church is to be the center for making disciples. The church, the church, we are the missionaries of the church to go out. We're the sent ones to go out and tell others about him. You see, the highest duty of any true believer is to be involved in the will of God. I want to be involved. I want, I want to know what God's will is. Well, it's right in here. It tells us. Guess what? It says over in 2 Peter 3, 9, For God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, Romans chapter 10 says, how are they going to hear unless somebody tells them? How's your neighbor going to hear? How's your children going to hear? How's your grandchildren going to hear? How is the world going to hear? How is Blue Springs going to hear? Unless we take it. We take it and we give it out. Are we doing missions? In order to have a heart for missions, we must see God. See, the Lord will call us to see him before he calls us to serve him. We need to see him high and lifted up. The news here of King Uzziah, death, had reached this young prophet. And maybe he was sorrowful. I don't know. Maybe he was grieving. But he entered into the courts of the temple. Oftentimes, I believe the Lord uses a crisis in our life to what? Kind of make us reflect on who God is. Because God is in control. He's the God of the mountain. He's the God of the valley. He's God. And he controls everything. And sometimes we have to go through some things for whatever reason, maybe to be conformed a little bit more to the image of his son, but to show us and reveal more of who he is to us, especially in those times when we're going through some very, very tough times. Remember that a vision is the method in the Old Testament by which God would reveal things to his servants. But today, we have the vision of God right here. The revelation of God that tells us what we need to do. The indwelling spirit of God speaks to us, instructs us, instructs us in his divine purposes that he has for us as a church but the reason why we're not involved in it, maybe we're not spending time understanding God's purpose and why he saved us. He saved us not to sit. He saved us to serve. He saved us to tell somebody about his son. You see, someone who sees God needs to see him personally. Notice what Isaiah said. He said, I saw the Lord. Can you go back to a time and place in your life where you could say, I know I got saved? Or 
you go back, you go, you know what? I've really always been a believer. I was born in church. My parents drugged me to church. You ought to listen to my daughter Angela's testimony. I mean, you know, I drugged all of our kids. I really did. I drug them all to church. Amen. Every time the doors were open, Sunday morning, Sunday night, it didn't matter. You know, just drug them. Just, just bring them. Just bring them. They'd sleep in the pews. We'd give them coloring books, whatever, when they were kids. We had them right in here. It's just the way it is. We want our kids in church. We want them, want them under the spout where the glory comes out. But even in spite of that, even in spite of that, Angela thought she was saved, made several professions, got baptized several times, and didn't realize until later on after in her second marriage that she was lost. And she saw God. And God miraculously saved her. Woo! Can you go back to a time where you saw him personally. It was a personal decision where you called him. I love Ephesians 1.13. Let me read it to you. It says, In whom, Jesus, ye also trusted. Did you trust him? Did you trust him to save you? He says, After ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, Jesus died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day. That's the gospel of your salvation. In whom, Jesus, also after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Can you go back to that day? I saw the Lord personally. How about positionally? Do you see him on the throne? Or are you on the throne? You know, remember, the characteristic of a Christian, a true believer, is obedience. Is obedience to the command of God. Are we being obedient to his command? He is God. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. I like what David Livingston said. I spent a long time in Africa, and I read a lot of his diaries He said this, he said, I never consider a command from our king as a sacrifice. He says, it is a privilege. It's an honor. It's a privilege that he's given to us that we can share him with others. Had a guy on the golf course. I play in a men's league every once in a while. Love a bunch of lost guys. I love it. Okay. They're out there, and first guy hit a shot. He heard, hit a really bad shot. He goes, Jesus. I mean, of course, he said it real loud. And I went, you know him? I know him. Isn't he wonderful? He saved my soul and gave me. And the guy's just looking at me. You know, I got anyway. He didn't say that name the rest of the course. Amen. Because I was hoping he would. I'd bring it up again. Amen. How wonderful he is. The fact that he saved my soul. See, I believe the greatest need for First Bible Baptist Church today is to once again, if you're not seeing it, but to see the glory of God. Because you know what happens when somebody gets saved? The glory of God shows up. Because I can't save anybody. I heard a great testimony about a funeral this morning that I preached a while back, and some young man raised their hand but didn't come forward but went to Miss Debbie and said, you know, I just want you to know I got saved during that funeral, and I've got baptized, and man, just fought. (sighs) Hallelujah. Guess what? The glory of God showed up that day because I can't save anybody. God saves them. I just have to deliver the message and then let God do what he does best. And his glory will show up. But the greatest need of First Bible Baptist Church is to see the glory of God show up. And the power of God to show up. And for people to get right with God and say, you know, I'm tired of my apathy. I'm tired of my ignorance. And I want to get back to where I had that zeal and hunger to see people saved. To get the word out. To go beyond my fear I don't like to be rejected. 
guess what? I'm rejected nine out of ten times. People laugh. It's okay. I'm not saying they'll stick a dog on you, but I've had a dog sicked on me. I've had guns pulled on me. It's okay. Hey, you shoot me, I'm going to heaven. Man, I win. It's like the witch doctor told me. You'll be dead before the end of the day. I said, you're threatening me with heaven. Come on, church. Let's get on point. But we got to see him positionally. We got to see his purpose. Look what he says there. He said, let the whole earth be full of his glory. His glory. Oh, we need to see that each and every day. See, a heart for mission sees God. A heart for missions surrenders to God. The Lord has called us to lives of complete surrender. Not one hand going up and the other one in the cookie jar, but both hands going up and say, I surrender all. All to him I owe. I'm a steward. I own nothing. God saved my soul. God owns everything that he's allowed me to have my hands upon. He owns it all. I'm just a steward of the manifold grace of God. I need to understand that. I'm afraid some of us, maybe, maybe we surrendered a long time ago. Maybe we forgot that. Maybe we need to go back to that place. Maybe there's a place, a closet, whatever it is. But notice verse 5 there in Isaiah 6. Uh, the prophet said, woe unto me. He got a true vision of God. He saw God high and lifted up. And guess what happens when that happens? We sense our own unworthiness. I'm not worthy to step into his presence. I know what I am. I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God and by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because when I see him high and lifted up and see his holiness, I know where I need to be. On my face, woe is me. God, I'm a man of unclean lips. God, I'm a, among people of unclean lips. Oh, God, have mercy on me. I failed. Yes. But guess what? Confess it. Turn. Get up. And keep going for the Lord, for he's worthy to be praised in our life. He's worthy of any type of thing that we can do for him. Someone said that vision without action is a daydream. See, we have a vision. We sit here and go, you know what? Yeah, the world needs to be reached. Yeah, I, I go to First Bible Baptist Church, and man, it, it's the job of Bob. Honor. You know, it's the job of Pastor Mark and Dwayne and, and Steve, and it's, it's their job, you know, and it's just, guess what? He's called, if you're born again in this room today, you're called to be a witness. You say, well, I don't know how to do that. You don't know how to do that? Let me talk. Okay, right here, right here. Hello, I have something. Would you, would you, it's a gift for you. You're so sweet for taking that, amen. I'm not going to give you one. You reject it. You know what? Here's a New Testament. I'd like to give this as a gift to you right there. Read it. Go home. It'll tell you how to be saved, amen. See, I know he's a little harder. i got to speak to him more firm, amen, just looking at him. It's very seldom. I, I know you get people say, no, I don't want it, but sometimes they take it. Sometimes they take it. And you just say, hey, read that at your own convenience, you know, I remember, I don't, I don't remember giving out the track, but either Dennis or myself or somebody at the mission gave out a track, and I've told this story so many times here, to that guy that was visiting from Malawi, and he got saved. Went back to Malawi, didn't have a Bible, led his whole village to Christ with one track, okay? And so they would meet. It said, it said on the track, meet every Sunday. So they met every Sunday, and they read the track. That's all they had. And they would sing a couple songs, make up some songs, but they would sing. And then it said, go share your faith. So everybody memorized the track and went to the next village. 
and led all those people to the Lord in the next village. So over now, we have over 350 people meeting every week from several villages with one piece of paper. It's all tore up. Now, on the back of that track was the address of Kapula Futa Baptist Mission in Zambia. So they sold some cows and goats, gave the guy a bus ticket. He shows up at our mission station, knocks on our dead gate that day. and said, I'm here. And I said, well, who are you? Well, somebody he showed me this old beat-up track. I wish I had it today, but he showed it to me. He said, we don't have a Bible. And he told me the story of what happened. He said, can you come? So Dennis Anderson and I loaded up a bunch of suitcases of Bibles and all kinds of teaching, discipleship stuff, and we flew to Malawi and went to this village. And for eight days, we were there with 350 men and women sharing the Word of God with them, all from one tract. A man from a funeral, you don't know until you hear, made my day, Miss Debbie, telling me that story today. You see, God's Word will not return void, but it will accomplish what it has been sent to do. And the Bible says you're not born again with corruptible things, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Notice some things the Spirit is doing in the heart of Isaiah. Surrender not only reveals the nature of, of our sinfulness, but also the nature of our helplessness. Have you ever felt a lot of anxiety when you're witnessing to somebody and you kind of feel like you're helpless, don't you? You feel like, man, I, I hope he doesn't ask the tough question. You know, like, did Adam have a navel? I don't know where that came from. <laughs> I'm helpless without him. I'm hopeless without him. He should be everything to us, especially when we're giving out the word of God. Because I know I can't save anybody. I'm just commanded to tell them about a Savior. So again, we need to surrender to God. And guess what? That surrender needs to be personal. I can't surrender for you. See, he says, woe is me. You have to personally decide, am I going to? to be obedient to God. We're not talking about being obedient to me. You don't answer to me. We answer to God. You and I are going to give an account one day. We're going to probably be kneeling before Jesus Christ, and we're going to give an account, not for salvation. I'm talking about the judgment seat of Christ. And all those places we've been and all those people we've been where we had an opportunity to share our faith, give a tract, share a New Testament, and we did not do it. But we kept our mouth closed. Isaiah said, woe to me. Notice it was a powerful surrender. These seraphims flew. Guess what? Man, you can't do it in your own power. You've got to do it in the power of God. And what God is doing. I remember one time in the bush of Africa, one of the pastors asked me to come and preach on giving. You know, just giving. I went and I preached on giving in the church, and we had 20 people come forward for salvation. I'm thinking, maybe I shouldn't give the gospel. Maybe I ought to just preach on giving wherever I go. And the reason why is because, see, it's not my message. God's message, His Word, His Spirit. And so when we give it out and they take it and they read it, they're hearing from God in those scriptures. Again, it's a purifying surrender. It's a powerful surrender. And then notice that a heart for missions not only sees God and surrenders to God, but they serve God. 
See, the Lord has called us to a mission of redemption. Now that we have been purified, now that we've been clean, now that his power lives in us, now we can praise him. Now we can open our mouth and speak how wonderful God is and how he saved our soul. The prophet was now ready to hear the voice of God and be commissioned to do the mission. That's God's way of doing things. Notice in verse number 8 it says, Here am I, what? Send me. When people do not respond to the call of missions, when they don't respond to giving out the word of God, when they don't respond, it is evidence that maybe they have never seen God in all his glory. They've never seen his power in action. And they really don't understand the purpose of why God saved them. God saved you for a reason. And that's not just to live your own dream. God saved you and I and placed us in his vision, in his way, in his truth, and in his life. To have that heart for missions, we need to serve God. So the question, are we holding back when the Savior calls? When the Savior calls for us to pass out a track, do we hold back? Oh, gosh. I wept during the first service. I was reminded just recently of opportunities that I've had personally. And all of a sudden, they just kind of went, but they were there. And I didn't take advantage. And the conviction flooded my soul. I believe our Savior weeps over the lost souls of this world. What about us? Do we have a heart? Do we have a sense for missions? I speak a lot about David Livingston when I preach. You heard me. David Livingston was actually on his way to China. I don't know if you knew that. Before he went to Africa, he was on his way to China. And he met a fellow by the name of Robert Moffat, who was a missionary in South Africa. And Robert Moffat was talking about every morning when Moffat would get up, he would look over in this direction, he'd see this smoke coming up from the trees of a fire in a village. You know, they were keeping warm and cooking. And over there, he would see smoke from another village, and another village would be coming up. And, and so Robert Moffat told David Livy, he says, David, every morning when I get up, he said, I see the smoke of a thousand villages that have never heard the name of Jesus. Guess what, First Bible Baptist Church? Have you looked around at Blue Springs lately? Have you looked up at all the houses that are going up on the south end and the north end? What about Grain Valley? There are thousands of people moving that are already here but are moving into our area, and some of them have never heard the gospel. Does it move you? Does it move you just a little bit? Maybe to take some of these tracks during the invitation time and put them in your purse, put them in your pocket, keep them in your car. How about some New Testaments to be able to give out as gifts? Because we as a church, we are commanded by Almighty God to take the Word of God out. Do we weep over that? A heart for missions that serves God. No greater honor can be conferred upon a Christian that, than to go and tell the story. This is God's priority until Jesus comes. We like to preach on the rapture, don't we? We like to see the clouds in the sky because then we start rapture practice, right? We, don't, we like to see. We don't like, we've seen some clouds the last few days, Amen. You know, basement flooded and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? We love to preach on that. 
but to preach on missions, to say, Lord, I see you. Lord, I, I surrender to your will. And Lord, I'm willing to serve you. You see, this is God's priority until he calls us home. He came once to die on the cross for our redemption. And soon he's coming back to reign and to judge. But until then, he has commanded us, commanded us five times in less than 40 days after the resurrection. Jesus said this, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe whatsoever things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. In Mark 16, he says, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke 24, I love this. He says, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. And then, of course, in John 15, ye have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bear much fruit. And then, of course, Acts 1.8, as we see when we leave here, it says, but ye shall receive power, the power, the power. When we see God positionally looking up, we're going to receive the power needed to be able to proclaim. He says, you're going to get the power there. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. You're going to tell people. Church, we need to tell people. We need to go. And the question is, are we prepared to die? To die to ease. To die to apathy. To die to indifference in order to take a track and share it with somebody else. You see, a heart for missions sees God. A heart for missions will, I surrender. A heart for missions is for me to go and serve and give out the word of God to other people. Our church has spent a lot of money. We believe in missions, don't we? Around the world. But what about all these homes going up? I see the lights. I might not see any smoke. But I see the lights of a thousand homes over there that might not have ever heard about Jesus. Woo! Here, we got some tools, folks. Oh, they are tools, but it's the Word of God. Are we giving it out? Are we giving it out? Will you bow your heads with a word of prayer with me? Father in heaven, we come in the name of Jesus. Lord, I read Isaiah 6, and this young prophet who just got overwhelmed with the news of King Uzziah dying, and in whatever state he's in, the sorrow, the grief, the hurting, he saw you. Woo. It was a specific time that he saw you. Lord, as you search our hearts right now, can we go back to that specific time when we saw you, God? when we called upon you to save us. Oh God, speak to our hearts. Lord, you've already spoken to me even the first service. God, I need to be on point. Lord, missions, we are all 
as members of this church, missionaries, you have called us. Lord, our church is about family, yes. It's about sports, yes. But it's about missions. It's about taking your word out from this place. Lord, this church should be a launching pad for the gospel. So, God, I pray during this invitation time, speak to people's hearts. Lord, help us to see you, Lord, that we'll come to you and say, oh, man, Lord, my sinfulness, my apathy. I've just been a person that just says, you know what, I just don't care. Someone cared for you. Someone cared enough for me. To tell me about you, Jesus. Do I care? Do I want that back? God, I need a touch from you today. Lord, send conviction, I believe, into our heart. Holy Spirit of God, we need to be on point. So help us to do that. Help us to get your word out. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. I'm going to invite you to come to the altar. There are some New Testaments here. Take a few. There's some tracks. Maybe you just want to pray. Maybe you've been apathetic. Maybe you haven't been on point all the time. Maybe you just want to come up and say, God, I want to see you again. I want to see you high and lifted up. You are my king. You're my savior, oh God. Help me to be on point. Help me to serve you. So would you come? Join us at the altar.